you will uh, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation and chapter 2. The book of Revelation and chapter 2. All right. Let me get over to. How many of you own a Schofield Bible? Can I see? You own a Schofield Bible. One, two, three, four. Okay. There was a time when we would ask that question and about every hand in the audience would go up. Uh, Schofield Bibles were um, Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, uh, who had kind of a checkered past, personally, um, after he was converted, was very curious uh, about the matter of fundamentalism, was indeed himself a fundamentalist. And there uh, happened to be going back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was a controversy about millennialism, that is, the return of Christ, whether it was whether Christ would return prior uh, to uh, the millennium or uh, after the millennium, or and in our case, in my personal case, I am what is referred to as a pre-free. And so... Uh, he's coming back before the millennium, but he's also coming back before the tribulation. And so um, that many, I'm speaking for many of you, and I have found this, and it's, I understand it, it's not a compliment necessarily. Many people, when you ask them what they believe about things like this, they will say, well, I believe what the preacher believes. Well, that's handy, I guess, but it doesn't help us in our own personal walk before the Lord. Our beliefs ought to be our own. So, um, just a few things before we start. Now, this is a teaching time more than a preaching time. I'll work in preaching somehow, I guess. But what happens is that I've got the thing kind of manuscripted. So, it's going to be head down and voice up, all right? And so, uh, we'll, when we get to that point. In the late 1800s and early in the 1900s prior to World War I, the theology of future events was pretty well dominated by what we refer to as post-millennial thinking. Because we were living kind of a golden era in the world and in America especially, and so post-millennial thought that, uh, and that was basically that we are going to do good, we are going to do right and proper and true, and we are going to encourage the kingdom to come into place, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And and that song can be taken a couple of ways there. So um, the um, premillennial return of Christ had little to encourage them because most people were postmillennial. World's getting better, we're going to do right, and we will usher in the kingdom age. That's generally speaking. Now, uh, <clears throat> C.I. Schofield, upon his conversion, kind of a rascal of a guy, but upon his conversion, he set about, and I think it was published in uh, 1901, somewhere in there, that he published his Bible. And in the publishing of his scriptures, um, did a good job. By the way, I have owned more Schofield Bibles than any other kind. I, I was brought up, I, I, that was my teething ring as growing up and maturing uh, in the faith. So um, I have a soft place. In fact, I still have I, my ordination Bible, the Schofield Bible. I have that at home. The, uh, I've got several others. I've had to have one cover replaced even. C.I. Schofield, Schofield set forth the history of the church using the seven churches listed in Revelation. That is why I'm bringing this up at all. If you have a Schofield Bible, you will look into the footnote section of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and he will say something like this. Now, I've cut it down so I can get through this in a hurry. He will list the churches in the order that they are listed. And he will do this. The church at Ephesus equates with the church age after the apostolic age. The church at Smyrna is the age of great persecution, running up to A.D. 13, 316. Excuse me. Uh, number church three, Pergamos, which I'm dealing with tonight, is married to the world. And he uses the word gamas out of Pergamos as marriage and as unfaithfulness in marriage, which I don't subscribe to that thinking. But Pergamus is married to the world, compromise, and 
that he didn't put a closure date on that because that compromise still goes on. Number four, Thyatira. The papacy was developed uh, from Pergamus uh, um, uh, and beyond. And so we're talking about 8,500 to 1,500, which is where that you begin with the Reformation period. Sardis, which follows Thyatira, represents the Reformation. Philadelphia, which is, has the least said wrong about it than any of the other churches, represents the true church. That is the least wrong that is told. And so it is representative of the true church. Laodicea is the final state of apostasy of the age, and that church represents that. I, do, I say that because that there are people that do subscribe to that, and I'm not going to debate those people. But I'm saying that that's not my choice of uh, setting the order of the church age by the listing of churches. Further, 1917, uh, Sinclair. You remember, how many of you remember Sinclair gas stations? I don't even know if there are any left in the whole world. But uh, the Sinclair family from, I believe, Ohio were believers, and they set aside large sum of money, and they hired some of the better theologians of the day to write a four-volume set to defend fundamentalism because it was under strong attack. Let's see, what was the title? Oh, I get it. Four volumes, bright, shiny red covers. And if you don't read them, they look brand new even to this day. And it's called The Fundamentals. And have you ever seen that four volume or uh, you are aware of it? And uh, we had people like A.C. Dixon and R.A. Torrey and others of that, of that thinking who wrote. And I mention that again because the fundamentalism of that day was in a struggle in the area of dispensations. In other words, that God sets aside certain areas with certain attributes uh, to deal with uh, certain things. So uh, after World War I, the carnage of World War I, post-millennial thinking fell into disfavor because the idea was that things were getting better and better, and all of a sudden we looked around and we had millions of people that died and the world wasn't getting better and better. So, uh, so post-millennial thinking kind of fell into disfavor. And for the f most part, fundamentalists called, and by the way, the term fundamentalist, um, when I was entering ministry and going on, why, it, you were a fundamentalist or you weren't a nobody, okay? And so the idea is that fundamentalism has taken on Muslim overtones, it has taken on so many other kind of overtones, and uh, in the public arena, uh, it's hard to disassociate yourself from those things, the bomb throwers and those. So I think there's a better term, and I've heard it used around here. The term is biblicist. I am a biblicist. I believe the Bible. I believe the Word of God. Kind of narrows the scope. Now, uh, on to the uh, churches, uh, the church that I mentioned here. And again, just a few other beginning things. Number one, all the churches uh, begin, and unto the angel, and blank, and write. And though intended for each church, it goes first to the messenger of that church. So if you read that, you believe that there's a word order that means things. It doesn't say send it to the general assembly of that church. It says you're writing this to the messenger of that church. Is it intended to go to the church? Yes, it's intended to go to the church. But it's going to stop off at the messenger who would be the, um, he would be somewhat of a pastor or a spiritual leader. I don't know if the idea there is that he's going to call a meeting, going to read the scroll, and go forward. What about this? All of the churches but Pergamos have the postscript. And I say all. There is one that Ephesus does this a little bit. All of the other churches have a postscript that is the very last statement made to those churches. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Not so in Ephesus, where is that there is one phrase that comes after that, and certainly not so in the church at Pergamos, when that there is a lot of verbiage, a lot of words that follow that statement down to the end and then goes to the next church. There are only two churches that uh, mention the Nicolaitans, and we're going to be talking about them, obviously, today. It's a compound word, Nico, uh, meaning conquered, and Laotens or Laos, meaning people. That is to conquer people, and they did. This is like uh, the illustration of Balaam and Balak that we're going to find here. Now that they wanted to destroy and take over uh, the uh, and destroy the nation of Israel, so meaning to conquer people. Um, <clears throat> so only two churches mentioned them, 
But here's some irony, and I think it has a teaching moment. It goes like this. In uh, chapter 2 and verse 6, you have the church of Ephesus, and God pays him a compliment, and he says, um, I understand that you won't have the Nicolaitans uh, involved in your, in your church, or they won't teach or do this, and he says, uh, you, hate the, you hate them, and that's, and by the way, that's God's term. He uses the word hate a couple times about the Nicolaitans, and heresy and error that destroys lives and peoples and sends people to hell. And so in this, he tells the church at Ephesus, you hate them, good for you. You're, that's not your theology, good for you. But when it comes to the church at Pergamos, they had invited them in and had fallen prey to that. And so in one church, he says, you and I agree on this. On the other church, he says this, I'm going to come visit you, and I'm going to deal with them. When that day of visitation, when, when God of heaven visits that church with judgment, I'll be dealing with that class of people. So churches 75 miles apart, uh, who probably not that many of them, and yet that they can have very differing uh, thoughts about the same topic. Um, last, number four, uh, though each church was addressed separately, there were, they were still to learn from the difficulty of all the other churches. What, what the church at Pergamos was to pay attention to was this, not only the statement, but also, catch this phrase, what the Spirit saith unto churches, plural. So what the Holy Spirit said to the church at Ephesus or Laodicea, the church at Pergamos was also to learn from that heresy or that error. Let's, um, let's move pretty quick here to the sheet that was handed you when you walked in about the city of Pergamos. It is on the western edge of Turkey. It is the northernmost city of the seven churches, located 16 miles inland from that um, western coast. Um, and it has river access to the Aegean Sea, the nearest body of water. It was 75 miles, this church, Pergamos, 75 miles north of Ephesus, which is the first one mentioned. It is 50 miles north of uh, Smyrna and 25 miles northwest of Thyatira, the fourth church, which will be presented, I think, next week. I'm not sure exactly when. The city was built on two levels. I'm talking about geographically, lower and higher. The lower level is where the, uh, let's see, the higher level contains shrines and public buildings. The lower level is where citizens lived and businessmen plied their trade. And I'd like to give you my thought, at least, on the name Pergamos, and there's a lot of different ideas out there. But here, I'm going to test this out before you. You can deal with it as you like. Here may explain the name of the city. Pergos means tower height. It means something that is like a citadel. And then the last word, gamos, has something to do with marriage or joining. Doesn't have to always be marriage. And the idea is that the people here were joined to the, to the edifices up here. That this lower level, will everybody live public buildings, and we're going to have four different um, uh, altars and areas for heathen worship up here. So these people are joined to these people, and I'm just setting that forth as an idea. As to history, the initial influences were Egyptian and later Greek. A ruling dynasty known as the Attaludes strengthened the Greek influence. Uh, there was at least, they went to the third generation. They erected shrines with altars dedicated to Dionysius, Athena, Asclepion, which is a mysticism and a medical uh, place where they would have uh, a theological approach to healing people. It went something like this. You went there and said, I'm not feeling good. They give you something to drink. It's a drug. You go out. They lower you in a pit with snakes. And they let the snake crawl over you. You may have nightmares, etc. But what happens when you wake up and wherever the snake is laying, that's what's hurting. You were then to go out and find a body part somewhere in Pergamos that had something to do with where that snake was laying. And then you were to take that over to the altar of Zeus and then offer it as a sacrifice. You were healed after that. It's just wonderful. Wonderful. So um, <clears throat> the Romans made the city the capital of the province known as Mysia. Uh, in Acts 16, 7 through 8, we are told Paul passed through uh, this region, approximately 80, 52, 55. And by the way, last week, our uh, brother Patrick did a good job with the, with the uh, map and with the dates, and I 
didn't want to have to repeat everything because I, I agreed pretty much with those dates. In Acts chapter 19, verse 10, we're told that Paul ministered in Ephesus, and he did this on his third missionary journey, and that for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia, or Mysia, heard the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, this would probably account for the beginning of the church at Pergamos. We're never told that they went there and preached, but they're told that they, we're told that they traveled through this area. I cannot imagine them traveling through that area without having a meeting and uh, someone, whether it was Paul or some of Paul's entourage, and so people would have been converted. And uh, so at the time, you ready? At the time that John wrote the book of Revelations, the church at Pergamos would have been in existence at least 40 years, and I think probably 45 years. And since they went into heresy, and they, one of the things that's interesting, when you start a church and those hardworking people come out and they start that church and they go like crazy and they uh, love the word of God and they go into a very uh, biblical mode, 40 years later, it's not always the case. And so what happens is that that may have been some, one part of the reason why that there was a transformation over to the Nicolaitans. Um, this would be a full generation removed. As to culture, it would be steeped in heathen religion and sacrifice, and there would be strong economic ties to this practice. One of the heathen deities, Asclepion, promoted the healing arts, and I've mentioned what they do. This would be comprised of drugs, mysticism, and sacrifice. It also developed a high-quality parchment industry. So they were well thought of in the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire was big into legal systems, and they needed lots of parchment paper, and so they had a good industry in that, and so uh, they were looked at. In fact, many of the uh, Roman officials that weren't feeling so well, they would come and seek medical treatment. Um, it boasted a very large library. In fact, uh, one of the Roman, uh, uh, let's see, I, I'm not sure what his title was, but he took some of the books from the library in Pergamos and took them to Alexandria because Alexandria was a better library and they didn't want any competition. But later on, I think it was Augustus who decided, no, 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 we're going to put some books back. So they went and took those books and brought them back. And again, a very large library and a good library in the city of Alexandria. And they had a strong middle class in this city. By middle class, I'm talking about people that had shops and industries and uh, people who had ties to, the, to all the heathen industry up the hill, and they would make artifacts. It's kind of like Ephesus in a way. And they would make artifacts, and they would have a good dollar relationship. And so one of the problems, too, is that people that promote Nicolaitanism also uh, really are saying, you know, if I lose my social status in this city, I might lose some money, so I'm going to go ahead and be a Nicolaitan. A... a, a um, there, there are three areas in this portion of Scripture that I'm going to allude to. Uh, it would be verses uh, 12 through uh, 13. I'm sorry, verse 12 as an introduction. Verse 13 as a commendation. Verse 14 as a condemnation. And 15 and 16 as well in the condemnation. Verse 17 as compensation. In other words, reward is promised and better things are coming. Now... Um, Commendation. These seven statements to the seven churches are intended for different churches, but they will be delivered to various angelos or messengers or spiritual leaders of each church. They in turn would read and perhaps explain these scrolls to those assembled. It would tend to draw a large crowd. I don't know if you have ever considered uh, the original breath of God from 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16, and 17, that all scriptures are given by inspiration that God breathes on uh, an individual and his breath, he exhales and gives scripture and gives his thought. This happened, this had to happen with John. God shows up and he visits John and he tells John what to write. Man, I'll tell you, what an exciting moment. But what about this? How many copies at the end of the day do you think that John had? Originally, he would have what? One. Call it autographa. We'd call it one original document. The breath of God is on that paper. And the idea then is that for him, John, he's, he's told to send it to these churches. 
I don't know which way. I, I, I don't have a good understanding of these things, and that I, so I don't know if uh, he sent the same letter and said, okay, you take it here, you stay with the letter, and then you take it here, and then you take it here. When you're done, bring it back home. Or uh, when he was, uh, after he got this, if perhaps then he said, okay, seven scribes, everybody makes one copy. You take it there, and you take it there, and you take it there. However it happened, there was one copy, and I'm just curious, and the only reason I bring it up, I think it's just interesting. How did God get the message to all those seven churches? And um, just like today, you know, you ask this question, how did this get in my hand? Well, there's a story behind that, and it's a miracle, and God does that, and he keeps his word together. Uh, <clears throat> the reference to a two-edged sword in verse 12 uses a term, it's romphion. I'm not saying it right, probably. It has to do with a large, broad-based sword as opposed to a shorter sword that would be used in different circumstances. The large sword was standard equipment for the Roman soldier when he was expected to be aggressive and take the battle to the enemy. His audience would understand. Now keep in mind, this is a Roman city of importance and they have officials there. And so Roman thinking is going to enter into this city. In my estimation, one of the ways to interpret this portion is to understand that the author, the God, puts in the mind of John, John, I want you to write some things down and we're going to use some Roman terms, Roman thoughts, Roman ideas. Why? Because the people in that heavily populated Roman city, those people understood those terms and they understood the meaning of them. And so therefore the communication process uh, would uh, be a good process. Again, uh, my, my view on this. So uh, <clears throat> there's a sword with two edges. Do you get the idea that perhaps at the church at Philadelphia, that there's a little bit more camaraderie involved. Or the church at Ephesus, you know, the first church mentioned, they did well, and, but you know, there was a, I want you to go back to your first love kind of thing. I get the idea in the church at Pergamos that God is addressing this with kind of an edge. I don't mean just a sword edge, but there's something edgy. There's something that God is saying, this isn't right, and we need to get it right. Now, God is not incorrect or unpolite. He does compliment them, and we're going to come to that in just a moment. But um, <clears throat> you, you have this, here I come, I've got this sword, and it's just thrown out there. It, it's the mention is that uh, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. God's business is a serious business. I think you'll agree. God holds the sword. He does. He says he does. We should be aggressive with biblical truth as God is aggressive with his thoughts and ideas toward this church. Believers, uh, uh, this book is written to both, this message to Pergamos is written both to believers and I'm sure that there are some unbelievers present. And um, Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is uh, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And our approach to life ought to be the same way. We should have a sword and carry it and know how to use it. Second to be 3, 16 and 17 talks about the breath of God. We're to reprove and rebuke. Again, not from our own anger, not from our own emotion, but from the scriptures. We should fight against complacency, corrupt doctrine, and equally aggressive culture, and fight for the advancement of the faith. Why not? Why not be aggressive? Why not be aggressive in missions and mission work? Paul used the analogy of being a good soldier when speaking to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Verse 13, two things that God knows. One, he knows what we're doing and he knows the conditions in which we labor. Let me read that verse. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Thou, beholdest, uh, thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. There's some things that these people did well. This is a commendation. It's an attaboy. It says, I know uh, your works. Now, in some case, that can be a threat. I don't know if you ever had situations at home where, oh, man, I don't have time for that illustration, but um, I don't know if you've ever had things at home when there comes a voice and you're by yourself. You might be doing a wonderful thing, a bad thing, a rotten thing, 
And a voice comes, sounds like mom or dad, better mom than dad probably, and mom says, what are you doing? And she doesn't know, and that's okay with you because you don't want her to know. Now, you might want her to know if it's something good, but more than likely if it's something challenging. But God knows, doesn't he? He knows what is good. He knows what's bad. I'm not making analogies to Santa Claus here. It is just simply the fact that God is omniscient. He's got to know. He knows what's happening. Do you know that God knows what's happening in your life? He knows what's happening in the life of uh, your extended family. He knows what's happening in the life of Grace Baptist Church. He knows when we're being faithful. He says, thou holdest. The word holdest is a cretain. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. It means to seize, to retain, to hold with purpose. They retained their identity with Christ. They held on to it. It was purposeful. What they did, they did with a purpose that the name of Christ would be the reason why that they set forth in public, that that'd be the reason why they do what they do. I, uh, I, it, it can happen, it easily happens, that uh, we, by way of application, uh, some college students leave church and they go away to college, and um, I've got a granddaughter getting ready to do that this fall, and someone says, uh, we're going to have a beer bash at such and such a park, and it's this and this, and you know, I, I'm sure you'll want to come. And the person says, no, I can't come because I have a lot of studying to do. Glad you're not going, but that's a cheesy way out, amen? The idea is, no, I'm not going because God in heaven doesn't want me to do that. Now, you may not say it exactly the way I said it, but Jesus needs to be the reason why you make certain decisions in life. And not just kind of generic things that won't offend or affect somebody in a different way. Here's another truth. He knows when we are being faithful in spite of the challenges we face. face. He says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Now in a minute we're going to talk about Satan and where he dwells, but they are dwelling in verse 13, I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's Satan's seat is. And the idea is this. I know what's going on. The word dwell here is more than just a a domicile. It's more than just a house. It is a place that you kind of call home and you feel comfortable. I know it is what you're doing. I know it is what you're uh, what uh, you're working at and what you're and and what's going on. I I know your challenges. And by the way, in just a moment, he's going to compliment them about being faithful, even while a fellow by the name of Antipas is going to be cruelly martyred. And so um, he knows. God knows what we're doing. He knows the conditions in which we labor. For instance, I have seen letters come back, and this is not not being pejorative to any missionary, any missionary field. I have seen letters come back from fields such as Mexico, or in some South American countries, or from the Philippines, or from some African countries. And there are lots of people get saved. Lots of people get saved. I'm not denying it. I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm not saying bad. I'm not saying, oh, well, you know, that was easy come, right? I'm not at all. I'm not diminishing anything. But I am saying this. There are people that have gone to Mongolia, and I've known them, and where that they might have two converts in four years. You follow what I'm saying. God knows what you're doing, and he knows where you're doing it. And sometimes those, those uh, assessments are, are not fair, I will say frankly because somebody is working in a far, far more difficult arena and situation. And so what happens is that in the midst of all of the Roman Empire and all the difficulties, there was, there was a bishop there, the lead guy. His name was Antipas. In fact, John, at least uh, church historians say that John had a lot to do with Antipas becoming a bishop at Pergamos. And so... Um, the people there that were in charge of the religion industry were upset. And historians have found this to be pretty factual. And that the people who were making idols, trinkets, etc., they went to the Roman authorities and said, look, this guy's prayers are driving the evil spirits away. Well, that's, that's a pretty good compliment, I think, if your prayer life can do that. And so what happens then, uh, the Roman government comes back on Antipas, 
and said, look, you've got to stop doing this. And, and so I want to get a pretty, a pagan priests and Antipas, were, they were bad for business. That's what he, Antipas was. Roman authorities ordered Antipas to offer sacrifice of wine and incense to a statue of Augustus, who happened to be the, the, Roman, uh, uh, the Roman emperor at the time. Uh, he was also, also supposed to declare that the emperor was Lord and God. Antipas refused and was put to death. I, uh, not to be gory, but I'm going to tell you how he died here. He, uh, when it was determined he would not change his mind, they brought him to the temple of Zeus in the altar of Zeus, and there they had a, a uh, brass kind of alloy uh, bull, and it was hollowed out, and the, the, he wasn't the first guy that this happened to. So they bound him up, and they put him up into the belly of this bull, and they had a fire underneath him, and he was put to death that way. He didn't stand at a stake of things and was burned at the stake. He was bound up, and he was literally roasted alive. The Roman government was looking for, uh, you know, I'm sorry, let me out. He didn't. What he did, and it is recorded that he prayed for the people of his church while he was dying. Now, um, it's hard for us to identify with that kind of thing today. I'm sure that there are places in the world it happens, maybe that and maybe worse. But then not only did uh, God know what they were doing, what what uh, was happening there and that there's some good things happening and it was in difficult situations. But he talked about Satan's seed and where Satan dwelleth. <clears throat> it carries the idea of being at home. The idea that Satan was at home in Pergamos, <clears throat> especially at the altar of Zeus. He was very comfortable there. You ready? He had the numbers. You know what that is in an athletic contest? You're going down, the blues line is going down, they've got a rush going and they got the numbers. It's three on one and you're looking for something to happen, Satan had the numbers. I mean, uh, the believers were outnumbered and Satan had the numbers. He, Satan was at home. He was comfortable there. He was like a fellow sitting in a chair with a remote in his hand, all right? Uh, <clears throat> and so he was in control in that area. Well, almost God always is in control. He has been and always will be. Revelation 20.10, here's what happens to Mr. Satan. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Game over. Sometimes God asks us to minister in a hellhole. Sometimes God will permit you to go into a situation that is just terrible, whether it is physically that way, whether it is emotionally that way. It, it can be so terrible. And so the people at Pergamos were ministering in a worsening situation all the time. So they compliments them for that, but then verses 14, 15, and 16, we come to the point of condemnation. <clears throat> truth does not take long from doing right to losing the fight. You stop practicing truth, and before long, you're out of business spiritually. Antipas was martyred in, 92, in AD 92. The revelation would be given to John approximately AD 98. And so what that means is there's a difference of approximately, and, I'm gonna, that, and I think that's legitimate thing to say here, approximately six years. So in six short years, six short years, they had gone from holding fast his name and not denying his faith to having God denounce them and say, I have a few things against thee. And it was this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So in six years, we went from here to here real quick. Can that happen in a spiritual life? Yeah, it can. Can it happen in, church, in the life of a church? Yeah, it can. What does that mean? That means that we have got to be, I'm not talking about being diligent in reporting Doug down here when he sits too close to his wife. Get away, man, it doesn't look it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact of us internally and our own self-examination. That's what I'm talking about. And so we can, um, if you were to pick out the worst sin in your life, what would it be? I got to thinking the other day, in fact, I told that care group, I think, I think the thing that bothers me, a lot of things bother me, I, it, there's things that haunt me a little bit, but the idea of selfishness, sometimes the longer I go, I think the more selfish I get. It amazes me the degree of things that I want and I uh, try to work at to get, or honey, would you, and I don't do enough for her, and I ask her to do a whole lot more for me, I'm selfish. And, and so um, there, there are things that just kind of live within us. It doesn't take long when we stop doing right to losing the fight. 
Again, Antipas, six years after he is martyred, this letter comes. Now, now let's just play time here. Let's say it takes six months for the letters to get out. Let's just say six months. Uh, where uh, they're not far, where John is, he's not far from Ephesus. And then you're just looking at the first three churches, man. You're just looking at just a little over 100 miles difference there. And the idea simply is that the letter that goes to Pergamos, people, the Angelos, the messenger, when he reads that, this message is going to be fresh in the minds of those people. And now John, through God and the Holy Spirit and a secretary writing it all down, he's saying this, he's saying that there were problems and you've had problems and it is fresh in their mind. You talk about a rough sermon? How about this? How about a rough sermon when David commits fornication and God gets this guy by the name of Nathan Prophet and it's not long after this whole business and Nathan comes and he tells him a story about the guy who had one little sheep. The guy came and took the sheep and, and David, self-righteous, I'll get that guy. You take me to him, we'll do it. And what happens is Nathan says, What's, what does Nathan say? You're the man. You're the guy. Fresh messages have a way of stinging. Let me say this. Allow yourself to be preached to. Will you do that? Allow yourself. Give the preacher permission. Pastor Kevin, Pastor Curtis, give them permission when they are preaching. Don't sit here and, and uh, just kind of be a judge on them. But uh, give them permission to uh, get going with it. And you accept it. The Christian's life is more than just one challenge. I have a few things against you. What do you mean? We went through Antipas, and now you're worried about a few Nicolaitans? Come on, God, what are you doing here? The song that we sing is from victory unto victory. In other words, there's more than one battle that's going to take place. I, uh, in uh, Galatians chapter 2, the life which I li now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Why? It's because every day that's true. What about this? Believers do not sin in general. Uh, we sin in particular. Sins have name and... Uh, if you would, please look at verse 15. Uh, you have, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And God left no, um, he left nothing foggy or hazy about this statement. In verse 14, he gives an illustration. He says, Balaam, or Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. Find it in verse 14. And uh, nothing happened, really. And God didn't uh, permit or allow. And so finally, uh, Balak and Balaam have it out, a little shouting match. And Balak tells Balaam to leave. But Balak, Balaam left this one idea. He said, stop the frontal attack. Stop going head-to-head -head with these hard-nosed people, these God-believers, these Decalogue people, these people who practice uh, their uh, faith and uh, toward God he said what you want to do is you want to go to the soft underbelly you want to go to their uh, into their moral life you want to get into their moral fiber you want to get into their feelings and so what he does he entices he, he teaches Balak to let there be a kind of a merging when that the moral life in Moab really didn't have an upside much but there was a good moral life over here, spiritually speaking, and those two things would come together. And it got to be quite a uh, pandemic, really. It got, it was, and so uh, during one of these moments, you have a guy by the name of Phineas, and he's watching this business go on. And so what happens is uh, they bring, and the, and the scripture says, I, I read it twice to make sure I got it right, that they bring him a Moabite. It's like, you know, he sent out for a call girl or something. Bring this Moabite. And he takes her into the tent, and they're going to be wicked. And Phineas says, not on my watch. And he takes his spear, and he goes over, and you know what he does in there? He runs them both through, kills them, and it stops it. And then they were told, okay, if people have done wrong, we are going to bring judgment on them. You know how many people died because of this approach 
that Balaam gave to Balak, and it worked. 24,000 Israelites died. 24,000. How many cities do you know that aren't that big? Well, <clears throat> to have something encouraged, and somebody might say, well, you know, it's small and it's kind of insignificant. No, I'm going to tell you something. Sin is not our friend. Sin is our enemy. I don't care how good it makes us feel. I don't care how much it helps our ego. Um, <clears throat> believers, do you like this? I, I love this phrase. Look at verse 16. Repent or else. Now, that's not the whole sentence. Repent, semicolon. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And he's talking about that same kind of sword. Let me point out something out here that I think is interesting. I want you to repent, change. It's an imperative, so it's not like you might want to sometime. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I don't think I'm reading anything into it. I think I'm taking the scriptures for face value. He's going to come to all of them. I'm coming to thee, plural, second person plural here. I'm coming to you folks. And when I get there, I'm going to have a real uh, war with those people who have been sinning. God again knows, does he not? He knows uh, what's going on. All right, I need to get this done. Uh, verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Again, notice the inverted order, to him that overcometh, and then at the end we have then the promise or a compensation that is offered. He that hath an ear. We understand by now that that means who, somebody's got a sympathetic ear. I'm sympathetic to what you have to say. I'm open to what you have to say. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. A lot of times when we study something like this, we are curious. I, I was curious when I started this. I had some ideas. Some ideas, I think, changed. What is a hidden manna? Remember now that they'd already alluded to the nation of Israel as an illustration. And now he's saying, listen, you remember back when God gave manna when these people were crying out for something? And I left it out there outside the camp and they could go and they find it. He said, well, I've got some for you personally. It's hidden manna. It's not hidden to where you can't find it. It's hidden to where you're the only one that can find it. Do you know that God has strengthening things for you if you will personalize with him? Do you pray? Do you open the scriptures and ask God, Lord, show me today. Do you ever take a problem to the scriptures and find out what the scripture says about the problem that you're struggling with? This hidden, it's personalized. God says, I have personal strength for you. He goes on to say, I will give to eat um, of the hidden man and will give him a white stone and uh, in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Here is one of the explanations that m might, and I might have come closer to this before but I don't think so now. That the stone was not just white, it was brilliant and it was a big, it was a large, uh, not large, it was a most colorful stone. And in the writing of that, there would be something about the person that would be given to this person. Notice now that this is after you're doing wrong. I want you to repent. And if you overcome, here's what's going to happen. And so in the doing of this, uh, God offers these two things beside the hidden manna. Let me give you what I think is the situation here. In the Roman system, in the Roman judicious system, they had judges and juries, by the way. And when someone was tried and a case was brought, and they would have a little pouch, and in the pouch, they would have black stones and white stones. And what would happen is if, you were, if, if your lawyer did a good job and he's getting you off, and the jury likes you or whatever, they pour out the white stone. That means you're out of here. That means you made it. No jail time for you. 
no bail, no nothing, you're gone, go, click up your heels, and get out of here. And I, and I believe that that is a better, and what's being said is, if you repent and do right, I'm not counting that against you. We'll just pick up and go forward. Free to go. Love me, serve me, go forward. And then the idea of a new name. One of the things that was happened in the Roman Empire, in the political system, when you were advanced, they gave you a new name. When we talk about Caesar Augustus, that was not his name. Oh, it's the name they gave him, Caesar or Kaiser Augustus. His name before that was Octavius. And they changed his name because he had moved on to better things. He had greater responsibilities. How about this? How about the time that uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, uh, that fellow, uh, that uh, um, he believed God and there's going to be a child there. And so uh, Abraham said, okay. So he went from Abram to Abraham. Sarah at that same time went from Sarai to Sarah. You have also, um, well, let's see. Oh, I'm going to keep going here. The idea is, and I'll just summarize and let it be. You've got that paper. I will not try to cover what's on the back of that handout. I'll let you read that for yourself. Boil the whole thing down to something simple and just to walk away and think about is this. God wants a pure church. He's dealing with churches. He's dealing with men who are dealing with churches. God wants a pure church. And he, um, he wants a church that will follow him. And here's something else. God loves us so much that he's willing to bring the big sword and challenge us so that we will repent. All right. Pastor Curtis, if you'll still love me. <laughs>